Thank you everyone for coming. Um, I'm Maria Nicanor, I'm the Executive Director of the Friends Design Alliance, and it's my pleasure tonight to introduce our sixth lecture in the Rice Architecture and Rice Design Alliance um, Fall Lecture Series um, this evening with Maria Lizarurskaya, who's joining us from London tonight. And um, I'd like to thank once again our, our Dean, John Kasparian, who couldn't be here tonight, as well as the Rice Architecture faculty who have been instrumental in putting this series together this year, as well as all of the RDA board members and our friends who support our programming throughout the year. So with that, I'm really thrilled to introduce you all to, um, to Maria. She uh, is one of the 16 members of Assemble, the collective studio in London, so we'll try and channel them all tonight here, even though she's the only one with us here tonight. And um, as you know, uh, Assemble is a multidisciplinary collective that works across architecture, design, and art, and it was founded in London in 2010 to undertake a single uh, built project that then derived into a variety of other um, diverse award-winning projects. Um, they've become known for retaining a very democratic, collective way of, of working, and, um, and that has enabled them to take on a series of projects that both um, design spaces, but also design kind of like the processes and organizational um, structures of the institutions that they work with sometimes. So that's a very fascinating part of the work that they do. So we'll hear about um, some of those projects tonight. And um, Maria uh, personally has led on research and policy development of affordable workspaces in London, um, and also on alternative approaches to housing development in the UK and abroad. And she's focused on affordable and, uh, and collective living strategies as well. She has also led on Assemble's Material Institute project in New Orleans, um, which is a transformation of an industrial property into um, a hub in the local community for uh, learning fashion and design. So I'm sure that'll be one of the projects that we hear about tonight. So with that, please join me in welcoming Maria. So I'm Maria and I'm part of Assemble. This is us on a roof, um, on a structure, one of the buildings that we designed and built uh, a few years ago. And it's modelled on a photograph of uh, the Amish barn raising. Um, I guess it's a bit romantic, but we're quite interested in this idea of building and construction as a social exercise and, you know, a way to bring people together. And obviously, you know, Amish, it's quite an extreme example, but um, yeah, we like to, to kind of have this romanticism and this idea of um, yeah, collectivity and family as, as a way of working. But um, yeah, so we've been working in London for the past nine years. Um, originally, um, we kind of got together just to do a project. Um, it was the Cinerodium where we wanted to transform an abandoned pe petrol station in London. Um, and really, it was just a desire to do something and to build a project and to have that kind of holistic, um, you know, way of doing a project like you do at architecture school where you have an idea and you do some sketches and models and then you, you know, build it. Um, and, you know, when we started working for practices, um, you kind of forget that holistic vision. You end up doing kind of detailing and learning very particular things and don't necessarily see a project built or finalised, so uh, we really just wanted to do that. So we wanted to make the cinema and uh, we looked at a lot of references of Art Deco cinemas, the golden age of the Picture Palace, um, and we didn't have much money, um, you know, it was, we were doing this in our spare time, like a hobby, um, and so we got a lot of uh, kind of material sponsorships and had to think about interesting ways of um, building this, so we, so we designed this very simple a uh, large curtain using industrial roofing insulation, Tyvek, and we got Tyvek to uh, donate some of the material. And I guess the, you know, the exciting thing about this project was um, that it was, it kind of grew organically in our spare time. We designed the space, but we also designed the film programme and we uh, ran the bar and uh, got dressed up and it was, you know, really creating a place, even if it's temporary. Um, so we kind of had this whole thing of it being on the road um, and at the end of each film we would raise the curtain up and 
the public would feel like they're on the street again. And because we, obviously there's not much sound insulation here, we programmed uh, films which are kind of American road movies so that you'd hear, you know, if you hear the car going past, it'd be kind of part of the film. <laughs> um, and yeah, I guess it was um, really, really hands-on. Um, it was fun. And um, yeah, it was kind of a lot of, kind of theatrical elements in the project and we got a lot of help from um, theatre professionals and our friends who are artists and other people in London. And, you know, this was, uh, yeah, it was a long time ago. We did, when we began, we were just um, meeting up in the pub or going to people's homes and just sketching and, you know, playing around. Um, and I guess this, you know, idea of having your own space, a studio, uh, really changed the way we were able to work. And um, after the senior rolling, we were able to find an industrial warehouse um, on the fringes of the Olympic Park in London. So this is, uh, I'm going to try and use this crazy pointer. So <laughs> um, <laughs> that's the Olympic, well, what was going to be the Olympic Park. <laughs> and uh, we were here uh, in an old uh, sign maker's warehouse. So this is what, how we found it. It was full of uh, signs and rubbish, whatever, trash. And um, it was empty for a few years. And the whole site was going to be... Uh, a development area for new ha new ha uh, housing and so we were able to receive this building for like uh, peppercorn rent for a few years in return for doing some public programming and um, kind of cleaning it up and stuff and so we that's when we had our first uh, office our studios um, and I guess really um, made, try to make the most of the industrial setting you know we had a lot of freedom because no one really cared what was happening there um, as much as central London um, we could make a lot of mess and noise. We would have lunch outside, grow vegetables, well, stuff. And um, and we were also interested in, you know, how we were part of this kind of industrial, uh, almost residential neighbourhood. And we made a study um, called Make Don't Make Do for the local authority, for the municipality, which... Um, kind of catalogued and documented the changes in the area. And so this drawing shows a map of all the different businesses and industrial activity that was happening there. And we thought it was important to do that because, um, you know, a lot of new developments at the time would be kind of saying, oh, we're building stuff where there is nothing there. There's actually a lot already there. Um, and we were really interested in, you know, this question of where, where does it go afterwards when you, when you make new developments, where does the sign maker, where does the whatever storage facilities and uh, other workshops go. And we, uh, as part of this research project, we um, proposed to build um, a kind of a new build uh, workshop, new build studios, affordable studios, because a lot of the um, kind of old industrial brick buildings were either being demolished or they were being sold for housing because that you know they're very valuable, becoming more valuable, and we wanted to find a cheap solution, and so um, we designed this building called the Yard House because it was built in our yard at the time, um, and it's yeah the idea is it's really basic uh, off the shelf. Uh, lumber structure, um, really basic um, insulation, so prefabricated insulation panels. You get a lot of these in like um, kind of out of town shopping or warehouse storage facilities. And really generous inside, so um, kind of tall ceilings, tall for London anyway, which is like four meters, um, and generous bays. So each bay would be 12 meters squared, which is about 120 square foot um, and we would uh, rent them out to different uh, artists so this is this is kind of where where we like finished the building you know the idea was to um, create a flexible frame and then different different artists or um, businesses would f kind of fit it out as they wanted to so, so it kind of saves time and money for us and for them if they don't want to finish it uh, fully and um, this is kind of this is how it was when it was inhabited. Um, so the artists and um, our product designers, furniture builders. Um, 
kind of, uh, and then the central space would become a place where different projects were assembled and um, kind of prototypes were displayed. And we, yeah, we made these chandeliers and um, the stairwell was actually built in collaboration with some carpenters that we um, were sharing a space with. And then to kind of make this very basic structure a bit more celebratory, you know, to, to say that it's important to have this industry in the city, we wanted to make a bespoke um, cladding element. So we um, found this book from the 60s about tile making and we kind of adapted their system uh, to make our own tiles. So we uh, rebuilt this um, metal frame and then uh, used concrete and concrete dyes to, to make these tiles. And so we basically just hung the tiles on the... Uh, so the prefabricated panels had some timber on top of them and then we hung them the tiles on top of that. This is the view from our neighbours. Um, and it was, yeah, it was kind of interesting because, um, yeah, it became a theatrical backdrop to a lot of our events. So, we were, you know, back then we were able to have all these huge raves because, um, you know, we could be quite loud until really late. Next to the big road, it was great. Uh, had bonfires. And it also became like a weird um, Instagram destination. So a lot of people would do uh, photo shoots there and... Um, we, like they had no idea about what was going on and we didn't know who they were. Um, so when we moved, we had to sadly move the building, uh, we'd still have people turning up looking for it. Um, I think it was in some like guides, um, weird travel guides. So, yeah. Uh, and then we've also seen it um, come up on, on people's phone covers. Um, yeah, and we actually, we, f we found this one company um, in Shenzhen, in China, but where we wanted to find out how much it would be to produce this cover, and we sent them the photo, and they were like, "Oh, it's an old design." <laughs> so <laughs> we kind of, yeah, missed out. <laughs> um, so yeah, now this is what's happening um, where we were. Yeah, so this is the residential development um, that was always in the plan, and it's finally happened. Was happening, so we had to leave. Um, and find a new place. And we made this image that we would share with lots of different uh, developers and um, local authorities, um, this idea of a shared workspace, um, so, you know, where different creative industries and businesses could work side by side. And, it, you know, I, I feel like we really benefited from having that because you really learn from other disciplines. You're also able to share um, things that you wouldn't be able to afford yourself, like a big photography studio or big wood or metal workshop, just the scale of stuff, you know, and um, I think it's also probably quite different in London than maybe it is here, but really space is just becoming more and more um, limited, especially for big, messy things. Um, so yeah, we were able to find um, another temporary location, so probably about five years, um, in Bermondsey, which is um, close to the River Thames, in a really interesting old residential neighbourhood and um, that's also being redeveloped now into kind of more housing and um, yeah a kind of improved uh, neighbourhood um, so yeah we're in a kind of old college building uh, which has been disused for a couple of years they're going to build a new school down the road um, and um, again we're kind of sharing with lots of people so basically we brought a lot of the old tenants we had in the old space, but also new ones. So expanding to uh, music as well as um, ceramics and other things. And this is the list of the tenants. It's, yeah, really cool people. So uh, workshop, um, so the, the workshop East group, they, um, they were there with us from the start and they set up like an amazing professional uh, wood workshop. And they were, a lot of them work as carpenters and we get to share their tools, which is cool. Um, then there's quite a few fine artists um, and uh, ceramicists um, and furniture makers and, and um, yeah, kind of, yeah, set designers, um, musicians upstairs. And yeah, and then there's us and we kind of get to um, use some of the equipment that the tenants have and um, kind of work on projects together. This is um, me and Louis uh, casting a toilet. So we're, kind of, we got this 
a ceramic mould from uh, an old factory in the north of England that produces um, toilets and uh, basins. It's called Armand the Shanks. It's a very, very big company. Um, and we were trying to um, kind of innovate in the uh, glazing of the, of the basins. We're kind of trying to make a marbled, marbled, <laughs> marbled basin. But it um, hasn't quite worked because the mould is a bit old, but it's fun. Um, we've also made a lot of furniture in the, in the studios. Um, this is using kind of offcuts of um, lumber from a nearby forest. And so putting it together, um, so gluing different bits together. Oops. Um, to create a set of furniture for a public park. And we also um, did a lot of prototyping um, and kind of building of, of elements for this Brutalist playground, which is a kind of foam version of Brutalist playgrounds um, that were designed all over London. Um, and we used the space for, yeah, just general prototyping and one-to-one -one testing. Um, so this is a test for an um, outdoor classroom for a school in London. And uh, yeah, we built these concrete, well, they're actually paper creates, so we've mixed paper and concrete to make it lighter, um, displays for um, traveling Lena Babadi exhibition. And these are some of the um, models that were made by uh, Madeleine Friesendop and also um, children in Bahia that she worked with. Um, and we've also uh, used our studio to make uh, prototypes and tests for larger buildings. So this is um, a test for a facade for Goldsmiths um, Art um, Gallery, a new gallery for the art school in South London. Basically, this is a concrete, uh, corrugated concrete roof um, tile, and we just yeah played around staining it and to kind of use it vertically rather than on a roof. And then we built a one-to-one -one test of the facade. So this is the yeah more of the same corrugated. Um, uh, yeah, roofing material, and then it's on a frame, and we we're just playing around with um, you know specials and corners, and how the, the system would actually work because we we weren't able to build um, the building ourselves, but we would need to kind of test it in order to draw um, the details for the contractors. And um, so this is the the vision for the facade, and it was actually completed last year, um, which was very exciting. Um, so this is inside the gallery. We also built the um, reception desk. And then, yeah, some more. Um, I guess, yeah, this, I guess this whole project was really interested in um, maintaining some of the old um, buildings. So it was converting an old um, Victorian baths um, and as well as adding new structures to it and just kind of leaving characterful um, textures and existing walls where possible and then adding new kind of more white cube style galleries um, where there had to be new ones. And this is an old oil tanks and uh, we also built um, uh, some furniture. So these are some um, passivated chairs. We've really um, enjoyed this, yeah, this way of working which allows for experimentation and prototyping and have, you know, having the ability and the space to work in a different way as an architect. Um, and this kind of culture of making is something we're researching more and more about. And um, back in 2012, 2000, yeah, end of 2011, we started this idea of, uh, you know, why don't we set up a makerspace in London? And obviously we kind of heard about the Fab Lab movement and um, the men's shed movement in Australia and other things that are happening around the world, but wanted to set something up specific to London. And um, Black Horse Workshop began um, as an idea um, because we heard about the developments that are happening in Black Horse Road, which is an area in North London. Again, another industrial area that's undergoing a lot of development, um, change from industrial to residential. And the council, the, the local authority, were quite interested in maintaining some of the semi-industrial or productive creative uses. And so we proposed to um, to set up this kind of library for tools, a place where you can learn um, through making things. Um, so it's, yeah, it's kind of, it's up and running. It's been running for five years now um, since we opened. And um, it's, it's kind of like a membership model where you can be a um, part-time member, you can have your own space upstairs. You can also just come for um, lessons in the evenings and learn basics of woodworking, metalworking, um, 
there's loads of other stuff um, people do, like building boats, <laughs> um, making instruments. Um, oh yeah, this is a drawing showing different things are happening across the two floors. It's still evolving, you know, it's still trying to see what's, um, what's the most important thing about the mission for the next two years. Um, and I think, it, I think it's been great because it's something that we set up, but it's very much got its own life now. Um, and even though we're on the board of trustees, we don't really have hands-on involvement at all. And um, a lot of the things that we've initially planned in the business plan um, have, haven't been good enough. So, <laughs> and it's changed and evolved, um, which has been great. So yeah, so that was London. Um, we've also um, kind of slowly started to branch out. And I think the way that we work um, really does rely on being somewhere for, for an amount of time to really understand or to kind of ask the right questions um, that we feel comfortable with. Obviously, we do kind of projects globally which are more traditional, or more short term, but we really enjoy this um, kind of investment in the place. And so the second place I'm going to talk about is Liverpool. Um, so we've been invited to build some new housing in um, what is called the Granby neighbourhood in Liverpool. Um, and the housing that we were originally going to design actually didn't um, happen. So, but in that process, we met um, a really interesting group. So Granby um, is historically a really diverse area. Um, a lot of the um, kind of working class, a lot of immigrants were there. Um, you know, obviously Liverpool's a port city. Um, and it, the kind of Granby neighbourhood was uh, really vibrant and full of um, kind of small businesses and, um, yeah, kind of street life. But it was also, um, you know, one of the cities in the UK uh, where, um, which had kind of the riots of the 80s. Um, these were mainly caused by um, kind of racial inequality and social and class inequality. Um, and because Granby was quite a, a very diverse neighbourhood, is one of the places that it happened. Um, um, after all of that, you know, the, the planning department wanted to uh, improve uh, or kind of bring up the value of the, of the neighbourhood, especially after the riots. I think it was um, it kind of a decline of industry. The neighbourhood um, became less um, populated and less, um, I guess, commercially uh, viable. And so the plan um, from the planning department was to tear down a lot of the old densely knitted Victorian streets and to build um, less dense kind of suburban typology of housing. And you can see what happened when, when they did that. So in the 1950s, um, the pink and the blues all show commercial industrial activity. And in 2016, it's, you know, so much more predominant on residential and that kind of street life um, only really remained at the bottom and the four remaining streets. Um, where because the council basically ran out of money to demolish the whole the whole area and those four streets remained um, and um, yeah I guess it's really sad because you know the council bought up a lot of the streets a lot of the properties and um, a lot of the residents had to leave and even though, you know whilst they did that development didn't necessarily take place so they were just there vacant um, for decades um, this is one of the streets that we were originally going to develop um, and it's yeah it's just crazy because a lot of the valuables were taken off the roof tiles um, uh, fireplaces um, yeah all the stuff that kind of uh, held it together and it really a lot of the buildings deteriorated and you know there's obviously political change and a realization that that wasn't necessarily the best thing to do um, but that all kind of took time and in the meantime um, there were a few residents that decided to stay and they didn't want to leave um, and they kind of took um, control of the streets um, because you know at that time um, the municipality wouldn't even come to remove the the trash it would be like kind of a bit abandoned uh, and unloved and unlooked after and so a few of them got together to repaint the, the houses um, kind of planting the streets and, and kind of forming um, some sort of community organisation. And there were a few different organisations um, that took place. Uh, we, we met the kind of the latest one, which is the Community Land Trust. Um, and they've, yeah, they kind of did an incredible job um, 
just, um, I guess, loving, loving their streets and being very creative and um, upkeeping the neighbourhood. And they also set up a market, which is still running today. We met them through this other project and um, they wanted to work with us um, on kind of proposing um, to renovate 10 houses and to create more commercial activity in the area. So they wanted to propose that to the council and wanted to work with some architects to do that. And so we, um, over time, got to know them and we put together this initial uh, document which um, just kind of analysed what was there already and, you know, speaking to the residents and um, surveying the buildings, we kind of put together some proposals about what you can do with a small budget in terms of, you know, um, how deteriorated are the buildings, how can you rescue them, what's the, you know, what's the most efficient thing you can do and a kind of holistic view of the whole neighbour, of the, the, of the whole four streets, you know, in terms of where could be a good place for um, commercial activity and things like that. And so, yeah, you can see inside um, some of the houses. Um, so the idea was, you know, if, if um, one of the floors has fallen through, then you'd create a double height space. This is a photograph of a 1 to 20 model that we made, um, physical model. <laughs> um, yeah, and we made a number of models where we played around, like dolls' houses, which is fun. And it was a really good way of I guess, speaking to the residents about what we're thinking, because it's very direct and clear. Um, yeah, and um, I guess we definitely wanted to keep and celebrate some of the old Victorian features, like the um, uh, chimneys and the uh, ceilings. Um, so we did, a, yeah, quite simple renovation. We focused a lot on insulating the envelope and um, kind of brightening up and, um, yeah, brightening up quite kind of closed Victorian uh, internal spaces. And um, we, um, yeah, we didn't have much money, so it's not anything grand or spectacular, but we did want to focus on a few kind of special elements in the homes, like um, special sh shelving or uh, door handles and um, colours and materials. And then this was um, two sets of houses that were really in a very bad um, condition and be really expensive to turn them into housing. So we proposed to make them into a winter garden, so kind of social area in the middle of the street, um, which would look um, the same as the houses from the outside, but inside um, would be this magical tropical garden, unlike anything in England. <laughs> but um, yeah, and that was something that was you know designed originally in the in the, in the first book, but really we were just able to finish it this year. So we got funding like a few years ago and um, it was complete, um, which is really exciting because it's um, kind of really signals, uh, I don't know, kind of a new start for the area because the houses were finished and now this. Um, and so one half of the house is this winter garden, which is maintained by a local horticulturalist gardener. Um, and the other half is like a residency space for different artists to come and work uh, in the community. Um, the showers were, I'll talk about that later, were designed by us as well, these tiles. Um, yeah, that's the, some of the people from the Community Land Trust at the opening. Um, yeah, and so Granby Workshop um, is a, another strand of the kind of master plan of projects which um, took place in Granby. Um, and that came out when we were designing the original um, houses because we didn't have much money to do anything spectacular, but we wanted to create a sense of um, kind of detail and bring back some of the val value and artistry that was maybe in those Victorian homes before that wasn't there now. And so we started by um, just experimenting and making stuff for the home. So we uh, were making these um, concrete fireplaces. So we would reuse a lot of the rubble from um, construction waste around the area and uh, mix with concrete and dye and brick and um, yeah make these fireplaces that then would go into the homes and um, through the process of working in the area and the opportunities that we received through um, Turner Prize nomination we were able to set up Granby Workshop which is now a fully functioning um, social enterprise so originally it was designed um, to make kind of stuff for the homes just in the area, but now it's really a ceramic business making stuff for any homes all over the world. Um, 
And so this was the Turner Prize exhibition where we exhibited the first range of products and they were all um, designed for the, specifically for the homes in Granby. So the fireplaces, um, there were some uh, just chairs, lampshades, um, cups, um, flower pots and things like that. Um, this is a range of um, door handles that we designed originally as well. And um, really the, I guess the principal driving force of this, um, of the philosophy of the business is to try and um, kind of create spontaneity and to um, have joy in a production, in a manufacturing business and to create difference in something which is also uh, regular. Um, and we made these um, and we wanted to kind of create processes that are not too difficult to take part in as well. And so these were fired uh, in a barbecue and we added like banana skins and wood chips to create the different textures. Um, then we kind of decided to try and scale up um, the manufacturing because, you know, obviously if you just work by hand, it's, everything's a lot slower. Um, so we got this uh, extruder, this, you know, it's a machine that's used in brick manufacturing business uh, to extrude bricks. Um, but we played around with it to make tiles. So we um, designed different jigs for it and extruded weird shapes. And we did, a, um, we did this first test in actually New York when, um, for ADO, this workspace in Brooklyn. And so these are the tiles that were made using this machine. Um, and then we got another machine uh, called the Ram Press. And that's really cool because, um, you can, again, you can have a mold at the bottom and then it just kind of rams it in and you can uh, make, you know, uh, plates, cups, tiles really quickly. And so, which is what we did. So we made um, some tiles for the Venice Biennale. Um, so you can see them all covering the floor. It's about 11,000 or something. Um, and um, then we also um, kind of explored some f wood firing. We went out to Japan and um, worked with some real, real skilled people out there in Mexico where we yeah, learned how to use the wood fire kiln and made some um, ceramics uh, there using their glazers. And the latest iteration of Granby Watch products is um, this kind of new 100% recycled ceramic uh, tableware. Um, so it's, it's using kind of um, glaze, uh, yeah, kind of um, um, d dust and rubble and slurry and old, old bits of um, glass from a lot of the industries in the north where we are based, um, so Stoke and Trent and then um, Armitage Shanks and other places like that, um, and kind of mix, mix it all together uh, to create a new glazers and new products. So yeah, you can see we used refractory bricks, broken slates, crushed tiles, um, industrial clay waste, crushed glass and marble dust. And uh, yeah, it's just been recently fully funded through Kickstarter, which is really exciting. Um, yeah, so, and the third place I'm going to talk about is New Orleans, which is very close to here. Um, I don't know how much people know about New Orleans. I mean, I'm just getting to know it really. Um, it was three years ago that we were invited to work on this project. And um, it's, um, you know, it's in a, it's in a ninth ward, eighth, between the eighth and ninth ward. So not the lower ninth, but it's, it's, I guess it's pretty close to where Katrina took place. But it's also just in a, in a neighborhood that's, um, yeah, it's not, it's not been loved for a while. You know, there's, all the roads have um, kind of, yeah, they're terrible. <laughs> and um, this building has been abandoned for a few years. It used to be a car mechanics and then a storage facility. And then it was used for raves. Um, this is it from the, fr from the front. Um, yeah, and this philanthropist, um, who's also part of Mona, got in touch. Um, so they started to set up an experimental art school in that building and in that area because um, she lived there and she believed that um, there needs to be more accessible free education, especially kind of creative education for those who don't have access to it. And it began, um, I wasn't involved at the time, but it began like five years ago or something, and they started it with a uh, gun buyback 
and um, I'm sure you guys know much more about that than us in the UK. But um, yeah, it was a way of getting to know the neighbourhood, um, you know, buying guns from some of the young people in the area. It sounded like it was mainly their parents or girlfriends that turned up, but... Um, and then, um, then four years ago, three years ago, they um, started a music recording studio, the Embassy, which has been uh, incredibly popular and some incredible music is being made there. And uh, food growing and kind of food education space, 24 carat garden, uh, where, yeah, they grow food and um, learn about gardening and making soap and all this stuff. Um, yeah, and so we got involved uh, initially to design a new building for all these departments and kind of other departments that were being designed and thought about. And uh, we began the process of getting to know some of the existing students and other people in the community. And then um, the project that we were working on kind of uh, didn't happen, but we um, kind of got to meet a lot of the students and saw that there's a lot of interest in fashion and some, some students already put on fashion shows. Um, and we met this guy, Terrace, who's kind of self-made fashion superstar. Um, and started to kind of just find out more about New Orleans, I guess. Um, and for the first time I saw a Mardi Gras Indian suit, I don't know how much you guys know about that. I was absolutely, I was just, yeah, didn't understand what I was looking at. It was incredible all hand-sewn, hand-beaded um, suits that were remade every year. Um, and the Second Line culture, which is um, these parades that take place every Sunday, and they're part of the jazz funeral um, history and culture in New Orleans, um, but still happening now and becoming more and more, I guess, public. Um, and so different, um, different groups, different clubs, put on one each Sunday and create costumes for it. And um, yeah, so if, I guess through that we, um, we realised there was really a lot of interest in fashion, a lot of interest in costuming, but there wasn't a space to do it or a space to learn more about it um, more formally. And so we proposed to set up a fashion department as part of this school. Oh yes, she's from Caramel Curves, they're <laughs> quite badass. Um, so yeah, and this idea of uh, creating a workshop, I guess in a similar kind of what we know about, I guess, uh, a space with tools where people can uh, create different things and new opportunities for themselves. And so we looked at um, this idea of an ecosystem in New Orleans where, um, you know, if you have enough kind of good quality equipment and enough space, there's a lot of things that you could produce. So we, you know, initially looked at a lot of different processes. Um, so we looked at weaving, um, Knitting and digital knitting, which is more industrial um, side of things. Uh, printing, so how you could, um, yeah, I guess make objects and um, print on existing material. And dyeing with natural ingredients, you know, thinking that somewhere like New Orleans, uh, you can really probably grow anything. So um, growing things like indigo, marigold. And uh, alternative materials, kind of looking into fish skins and uh, growing kombucha and all that stuff. Um, and then we um, ran a pilot, which was last year, um, November to December, where we wanted to try out a few of those things and see how it would work. So we collaborated with um, a Mardi Gras Indian chief, Big Chief Damon Melanson. Um, so you can see one of his suits. So this is all um, hand beaded stuff that he's wearing. And I guess it's not just the craft, but it's also the narratives that he's creating, which are amazing. Um, we worked with Kenneth Ize, who's now becoming a famous fashion superstar, but um, he's interesting because he works um, uh, with a lot of traditional um, hand weaving in Nigeria, and he turns it into this global uh, fashion brand, which is you know, used by celebrities worldwide. Um, Carola Jones, who's... Um, uses a lot of natural dyes and she's from North Carolina and she kind of, yeah, I think she has a lot of um, interest in the history and philosophy of dyeing as well as uh, the craft itself. And Faustine Steinmetz, who's a designer from London, who uh, again works a lot with hands-on techniques, um, mixing with contemporary technology. 
Um, and so we uh, were um, able to convert the ground floor of the, of the building. We planted trees in the courtyard. Um, yeah, and the, that kind of physical side of the things, that process began. We really had so little time, it was quite crazy. So we opened up um, um, the windows, these, you know, just broken out uh, like eggs and opened up the space and built a new room and uh, try to kind of make it, um, so it kind of turned a bit Miami Vice, but it was, you know, embracing the slightly tropical environment of New Orleans. I began to install some of the equipment downstairs, so uh, the loom, um, and then we also kind of designed a program of, um, educational program, trying out different lessons and seeing what was popular, what would work, um, yeah, how, how the whole thing could actually run. Um, sewing machines, we've got some really good industrial ones, uh, Juki's and a serger. And we, yeah, kind of began a series of um, just basics of sewing, as well as other things like, this is um, dye sublimation printer. So this is, this is absolutely extremely, probably the most popular thing there, um, where you can print any image you want and then uh, basically iron it on to fabric, but like properly heat, like heat press it on. Um, and yeah, and then we had our first show last year in December 15th. Um, this guy's, oh yeah, he, um, he does these ROP t-shirts, but he hand felt the images. Yeah, and we had a show which was uh, really great. Um, some fashion here, you can see. Um, this is all indigo dyed and um, hand folded dress. Um, yeah, and so the, the Material Institute has been growing since. Um, it's still very much in flux and we are, um, we've been kind of interviewing different directors, someone who would run it full time, still figuring out really the educational programme, you know, looking a lot of Black Mountain College and precedents like that. And uh, whilst trying to like think about realistic outcomes, you know, what is, what is the outcome for a student there? How can they get a job? Do they want to, you know, what kind of job do they want? Um, and just thinking about the whole economy of New Orleans, because a lot of the, I guess, talented or skilled people end up leaving because there aren't enough jobs there. And so how can you create industry in New Orleans as part of the school, potentially? Um, and um, yeah, it's been an interesting collaboration. So we, we were part of the Chicago Biennale this year. It's still on until November, I think. Um, so we created a, yeah, a kind of installation there with the students. Um, we got these tufting guns, so they're like an industrial, um, it's, yeah, it's industrial equipment for making carpets, basically. It's taken the old tradition of um, basically tufting a thread into fabric, but it does it in a gun. And uh, we use natural dyes, indigo, um, turmeric, cochineal, and other things. And then, uh, yeah, dyed yarns and wound yarns and kind of got into that whole weird um, area of textiles. And um, this is all in a courtyard in New Orleans, so trying out different things. And um, this is us with some of the teachers uh, trying out hanging this giant tent that we were then going to dye and tuft all together. And then we went on a road trip, <laughs> drove to Chicago. Which is, <laughs> it's, it, I think it's interesting as yeah, coming from Europe, you're like, oh, it's all in the same country. I'll just drive up there. And <laughs> took, <laughs> it took a while. Um, but it was great. It was cool. You know, we went out shopping in the middle somewhere. Um, <laughs> and then uh, we were really lucky because we were able to stay at one of Theaster Gates' studios one of his libraries and um, us and the students got a kind of grand tour of all of his properties in Chicago. I don't know how much you know about Theaster Gates, but he's um, an artist slash developer doing interesting things in Chicago. Um, this is his wood fire kill, so we check that out. Um, yeah, and then we dyed this giant fabric um, with cochineal um, and hung it up um, in one of the, in the gallery we're working in. And then everyone was tufting uh, a part of it. Uh, but also each student um, made the, a product as well. So, 
you know, someone made these crazy Japanese leg warmers. Um, we dyed loads of yarn, and um, this guy made a jacket, which is in inspired by some stained glass, <laughs> which is amazing. Um, yeah, and this is us at the opening of the exhibition, which is uh, really great. And it was interesting because um, I think maybe we often take these kind of opportunities for granted, you know, um, exhibitions or biennales, but it was really nice working with, I guess, younger people for whom it, wasn't a, it was a reason to create something new and it was really fun uh, working together. Um, this is a short film about the school. The Material Institute is a free fashion school in New Orleans. I taught the basics of how to stitch beads and how to string them on lines and so on. But in the same essence, I taught the culture. Because some people live in New Orleans all their life and didn't know nothing about the Indians. Fashion is just second nature for a lot of the Mardi Gras Indians and people who dress up every year for Mardi Gras, make a costume every year. My favorite thing is Second Lines. I just love the fashion there. It feels so New Orleans street culture, but it has a really particular flavor. Growing up, I've always seen even the slightest outfit, the smallest thing be translated into fashion here and for us to finally have this opportunity to hone in that concept of being a creative and being different. To be honest with you, I never expected anything like this to, to come to the city. It was going to be something quite small to begin with. We just thought, oh, we'll experiment with some textiles and work with some um, designers here. And then it just grew into actually setting up of like a institute. And I think we're all here because we in some form of fashion want to learn how to make clothes or work in some aspect of fashion design. And this is the first opportunity to make that happen. I'm Maria Lisogoska. I'm from Assemble. Um, and we are a London-based art and architecture collective. I design spaces, but also work a lot with um, setting up organizations and in particular interested in workspace and workshops and alternative places of learning. I could see students in there being able to start their own fashion lines. I can see students in there becoming bead artists better than me, you know, because of the ideas they have. I think it would be great if it um, allowed people to have more economic independence and get amazing jobs or start their own business. Now, like, I know that it's possible for me to actually be a designer. It's been a blessing for New Orleans to have Material Institute building what they're building out here. So my aim and my vision, just successful youth and successful young people coming out of there because of the unorthodox way of teaching. You have to have a free mind and a free spirit, and that's what Material Institute is. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to just end on this image, which is a photo of our lunch, lunch rotor in Assemble. Um, it's how we decide who cooks lunch, but it's also um, a way of, um, it's our only kind of punitive system. So if you're late for an important meeting, you get an extra point. That means you're more likely to make lunch. Um, yeah, and I think it's been really important, the kind of you know, designing the way that we work together in Assemble or with other people that we work with has been really important. I hope we continue to question it. Thank you.